you have your Bibles with you this morning, would you please make your way back to the book of Colossians, chapter 1. Today we are going to be studying just a small portion of text, but I believe it's very appropriate to our day and age. We're only going to be handling one verse today. And so uh, if you'll please bear with me. Uh, there's a lot of information that falls within this one verse. Colossians chapter 1, verse 24. If you have your Bibles, please follow as I read. The Apostle Paul wrote, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am supplementing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions in my behalf of his body, which is the church. Would you please pray with me this morning? Most glorious Heavenly Father, Lord, I would very humbly ask for your help today. Let your Holy Spirit proceed from your word and impact the hearts and lives of all who are able to hear this message. Let the words be yours. Let the voice that is heard be yours. And may you receive the glory and praise through the outcome of this message today. As I ask this in Jesus, Jesus name. Amen. Amen. This morning, I want to begin our, our study of this text with a very provocative question, something that I would like you to really deeply consider in your life. And it was brought about as, as, um, um, as a person gets older, one of the thoughts that kind of runs through their mind is, did I live my life to its fullest? Did I live my life for, if I'm a believer, did I live my life for the glory of God? Did I, did I serve my family well? Did I, did I accomplish all that I should? And as we get older we, and we realize the, the limitations of time and we realize the limitations of our bodies, we begin to ask questions like that. And so my question this morning, as we get into this message today, I want to ask it from the perspective of how it applies to your life and your relationship with your Savior and your King. That question is, if you don't have something you would die for, sacrifice for, give your all to, do you really have a life worth living? Last week, we heard a very good message that was presented through Andon in the study of the prior text. And what he read from was rightly described as the preeminence or the superiority of Christ. In verses 15 through 20, we heard what is known as the Christ hymn. And it, it is an exalted and powerful statement about the person and the work of Jesus. And within that text was found Christ's supremacy in every area within creation as a whole and as a redeemer to his people. And as Paul concluded this very lofty view of who Christ is, he takes that message and he brings it back down to earth to show his readers the application of this truth to their lives. He tries to express to them what this exalted view of Christ means to every believer. Paul takes them back and he reminds them of their past condition alienated from God, far from him, separated by their sin, enemies of God in their mind and deed. But then he proclaims the good news, the incredible good news of reconciliation that uh, through Christ and, and through their current condition through Christ, they are reconciled to God. I'm, I don't think that we fully fathom that, that one brief statement, you have been, through the blood of Christ, reconciled to God. 
what a profound, worshipful statement. We're reconciled to God by Christ through his physical body, through his death. He establishes that though once an enemy of God, that we are now in right standing with him. And finishing this proclamation, he gives his readers the aim, the purpose, the why of this incredible reconciliation. As we read in that last verse, it was for their future, as they are to be presented to the Father, holy, without blemish, and free from accusation. Because of our right standing, Paul then encourages the believers in the remainder of that text up to verse 24 to continue in their faith, to firmly establish and steadfast and, and, and be not moved away from the hope of this incredible gospel. In other words, what we read in that text is that true believers, true Christians, will stand in the test of time. And as we move into our study this morning, we're going to find the heart, the, the, the passion, the, the motivation in ministry, along with the desires that Paul had for the saints. But we're also going to see these areas as we, we go through this text. We're going to see these areas of his life and ministry and we're going to find areas that we too can learn from through his example and make application to our lives as well. And so Paul begins in verse 24 by making the statement, Now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. After Jesus appeared to Paul on the Damascus road, Paul was, of course, as you read the story, he was blinded and he was led into the city. And God called upon a man named Ananias to come and pray for Paul. And at first, Ananias pleaded with God because he had heard how vicious Paul had been towards the Christians. And God responded in reply to Ananias, in Acts chapter 9, verses 15 and 16, he said, Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And suffer Paul did. The statement that's there in verse 24 is, is not an uncommon one if you've read any of the Apostle Paul's writings. It was one that he references uh, multiple times in his ministry, that he truly did suffer for the cause of Christ. Not only did he suffer, and I want you to, I want you to kind of grab a hold of this aspect of this as well today, not only did he suffer physically, we know, and we're going to read in, in Scripture of all that he physically suffered, but I want you to also take into effect the, the, the continual overwhelming burden, emotional burdens of caring for the saints and the churches that were filled with the believers. See, it's all good, fun, and games to start a church. It's all good and fun and games to pastor a church. But there's also this, this overwhelming burden that is placed on your shoulders. Do I preach the word of God rightly before them? Do I minister to them as best as I possibly can? Do I take care of their spiritual needs? Do I lead them in the right direction? It's, it's a constant nagging that is, is continually in the back of the pastor's mind. Am I doing this the right way? Am I doing it for show? Am I doing it for God? Am I doing it for the people? Am I, what is taking place? And there's this continual emotional churning that, that takes place. So I want you to not only look at the, the suffering that the Apostle Paul dealt with, not only in his physical but also his emotional burden as well. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 28, he gave uh, a brief overview of the ex extent of his sufferings. As he wrote in that passage of scripture, he wrote, I more so in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without number, often in danger of death. Five times I re received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers on the sea, dangers among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardships through many sleepless nights, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Apart from such external things, there is the daily pressure of me, on me, of concerns for all the churches. And I also want you to remember where Paul is at as he's writing this letter. He, of course, is in a cell in Rome, and he's always under the threat of execution. He doesn't know if at the next moment the, the praetorian are going to come in and take him to his execution. And yet he still declares to the people of the church of Colossae, now I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. Was, John, was, was Paul just a glutton for punishment? Was he so heavenly minded, so, so super holy that all of a sudden these punishments and sufferings didn't bother him any longer? No, of course not. He looked at his overall goal, his divine purpose as a believer, as a representative of the glorious gospel and all that is entailed in that great task. And he viewed it in the same way a mother endures childbirth. There was a joy in the midst of the suffering because of the knowledge of what would be birthed through these efforts and these ordeals. It's the same heart and the same motivations that led Jesus to the cross. As we read in Hebrews 12, 2, looking only to Jesus, the originator and perfecter of the faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Think of it this way. Paul had, had birthed these churches in Asia, Asia Minor. He put his blood, his sweat, his tears into them. He had traveled. He had preached. He had discipled. He had labored. He had appointed leaders for years. And even though he had not visited Colossae and, had, and Epaphras had been the one that founded that church, he felt the weight of their spiritual health and their maturity. Paul understood that the suffering that he was enduring in this world was the means by which God would bring salvation into the world to the people. You've got to hear that again. Paul understood that the suffering that he was enduring in this world was the means by which God would bring salvation into the world and to the people. In some of the last words that he wrote to Pastor Timothy, he wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 10, Now you followed my teaching, conduct, purpose, faith, patience, love, perseverance, persecutions, and sufferings, such as happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Church, it's very clearly obvious that none of us wants to go through a time of difficulty and suffering. It's very obvious and clear because no one wants to give up their comforts 
We try avoiding any and all suffering at all costs, up to and including we now follow pastors and churches from mainline churches today as they and we elevate those pastors who have made it a point to remove these verses out of their messages and try to go the opposite direction to say that God wants you to have health, wealth, and prosperity. Many have gone so far to promote pastors who promote a suffering-free Christianity. But church, realize that there is a reason behind the suffering. The early church, as we read throughout the scriptures, considered it. And I want you to contemplate this along with the Apostle Paul. They considered it a privilege to suffer for the name of Christ. And we can learn from that today, too. Why was suffering a cause for joy? Well, the New Testament gives us five quick reasons. Number one, suffering draws a believer closer to Christ. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 10, Paul wrote, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. We understand what Christ went through for our sins. We understand what Christ went through in this world. And the more that we understand that, the more that we can relate to it, the more that we can, we can draw into that and see how great our Lord is. We understand on a higher and greater level what Christ went through in his sufferings as we too suffer for his cause. And we can look at him and say, if Christ can make it through, if the Apostle Paul can make it through, if the Reformers, if, if those that have gone before us can make it through, we can make it through as well for his glory. Number two, suffering assures the believer that they belong to Christ. In John chapter 15, verse 18, Jesus said, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 14, uh, Peter tells the suffering Christians, he says, if you are insulted or reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because of the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Through suffering, the believer senses the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives, which affirms and assures the believer of their salvation. Think of it this way. Let's use it in the reverse, uh, reverse mode. An unredeemed person would not continually put themselves in this position of suffering for his glory. Amen? Number three, suffering brings future reward. In Romans chapter 8, verse 18, the apostle Paul wrote, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, he wrote, For our momentary light affliction. Isn't that amazing? The Apostle Paul, after that great big old long list that I read there in 2 Corinthians, all of a sudden he says, For, that, for our momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond comparison. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. But then in number four, and number four is where I want to land for just a little bit. Suffering can result in the salvation of others. There's two ways that I want to view this statement. The first may seem so harsh to say to some people, but it is the utmost in truth. And it comes out like this. You can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. Amen? You can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. What I mean by this is that we as the church cannot, please hear me today, we cannot sit by the doors of the church and wait for them to come in and drop to their knees and give their lives to the Lord. 
The Apostle Paul said it right here. He said, this is the means by which they're going to come. If we offer it. suffering is the way that they're coming. And we're going to have to go through those, those people that hate God. And we're going to have to get through them. And we're going to have to be spit on and attacked verbally. And we're going to have to go through some difficult times. Uh, all you have to do is watch so social media these days. And you just uh, you sit there and the fear of, of the world just comes right upon you. I don't want to put myself in that position. But we used to have a saying when I was a youth pastor. And, and if there was ever a time when this statement is true, it has to be today. Everything that we do, we do for the one. For the one. We're not going to be able to reach all the people. Amen? We're not going to be able to convince everyone of their need for the Savior. But if we can, through our, our proclamation of the truth of the gospel, reach that one person. Actually, if you want to be truthfully honest, if you want to get semantic about it, it's God who reaches them through us but part of the equation is we have to be obedient are we going to lose friends better believe it are we going to lose family members for sure are we going to have hard times are we going to end up in court maybe but suffering is the means of salvation in this world the proclamation of the gospel. Romans chapter 10, verses 14 and 15 says, How then are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in him who have they, whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? But how are they to preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news of good things. But as we press forward, we're going to be able to reach those who will, through the Holy Spirit, respond to the gospel message. I believe over the last century, I'll give it that much, we have sat back on our heels. Have there been people that have gone out? Yes, there has. There's been people that have gone out, and believe me, their names have been dragged through the dirt. But they have brought people into the kingdom through their obedience, through their sacrifice, through their suffering. But then the majority of those that have fallen prey to that suffering-free gospel have sat back in the churches and watched as they die on the vine. Amen? Secondly and simply, the Bible is filled with accounts of those who came to Christ after watching others endure suffering for him. Okay? And number five, and this one's probably my favorite right behind number four. Suffering frustrates Satan. <laughs> Simply put, Satan wants the suffering to sideline us. As I mentioned earlier, if you watch any social media, if you watch videos at all of, of street evangelists and those that are going out into the street and they, they hear the questions and they hear the world come at them and you think, I could never do that. Well, guess what? You can't. The Holy Spirit can through you. How can you accomplish this? How can you, how can you preach to a world that doesn't want to hear it? Very simply put, because God goes before us. Amen? It's the means by which people are saved. The devil wants to, to sideline us, to scare us into submission to him. But we are to charge forward with the knowledge that no matter what, God will bring good out of our efforts and frustrate the devil. Amen? This is why I began our lesson today with that question. If you don't have something you would die for, sacrifice for, give your all to, do you really have a life worth living? Paul didn't see his suffering in the same light as the modern day church as a negative. He saw it as a necessity, as a, a requirement, as an obligation, and he rejoices in what he is suffering for. 
a few short years ago, there was a movie that came out, and I think it, it epitomizes what, what we have been studying here in this message. But there was a gentleman back in World War II, you may have seen the movie, you may have heard the story, but a gentleman by the name of Desmond Doss, American soldier during the Battle of Okinawa, and it was an area known as Hacksaw Ridge. And if you've seen the movie, okay, if you haven't, during the battlefield scene, right, it is estimated that he saved upward 75 soldiers, not caring about what was happening to him, not carrying a firearm, but to go into the battle to save these soldiers. And his prayer with each one was, Lord, help me get one more just one more. If we were to look at this, if I were to say, Lord, as we look at this battlefield called earth, the battlefield of Buell, give us that same heart, not only for the physical being, but for every soul of men that is lost on this battlefield. I tell you what, it's, it goes far beyond a medal of valor. It goes far beyond to reach and save the lost for the glory of the king. So Paul rejoices in his suffering for the sake of the believers. But he continues in verse 24 by, 24 by making the statement, he says, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Well, as we read that, and as some have read this, is this Paul trying to tell us that there was something lacking in Jesus's redemptive suffering? And that he of his own abilities, the Apostle Paul speaking, needed to do something to fill that gap? Well, unfortunately, according to the Roman the Catholic Church, that's how they took this passage of Scripture. That the that Christ did what he could do, but there's a gap. However, the Apostle Paul just got finished telling the believers that they were rescued from the dominion of darkness and brought into the kingdom of the Son in verse 13. And he told them that they had been completely reconciled in all things by making peace through Christ's blood shed on the cross in verse 20. And Jesus himself upon that cross said, It is finished. What more needs to be accomplished? What then is Paul trying to convey in this statement in verse 24, as he says, and in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Well, I can answer this question this morning, utilizing a story that comes just prior to the Reformation. It's a re, re, pre-Reformation period. And the gentleman is John Wycliffe. He was called the morning star of the Protestant Reformation. And throughout his life, he rallied against the false teachings of the Roman Catholic Church. Contrary to the Roman Catholic Church, he had come to regard the scriptures as the only reliable guide to the truth about God and maintain that all Christians should rely upon the Bible rather than the unreliable and frequently self-serving teachings of popes and clerics. He said that there was no scriptural justification for the papacy's existence and attacked the riches and power that popes and the church as a whole had acquired. He disapproved of clerical celibacy, pilgrimages, the selling of indulgences, and the praying to the saints. He thought the monasteries were corrupt and the immorality which many clerics often behaved invalidated the sacraments they conducted. If clerics were accused of crimes, they should be tried in the ordinary lay courts, not in their special, sometimes hidden, ecclesiastical tribunals. John Wycliffe was very upset. He was the precursor, the morning sun uh, star to, to uh, Martin Luther. 
as he began to read the scriptures and see, whoa, we're going the wrong direction. Excuse me. Needless to say, John Wycliffe, in his years of ministry, speaking out for the truth, he gathered, oh, possibly a few enemies along the way and was hated by many, governments included. On December 28, 1384, he suffered a stroke, and a couple days later, on the 31st, he passed away. And they buried him in Letterworth Churchward. Around 45 years later, because of their absolute hatred for him and for what he started, he was actually dug up, and his bones were buried, symbolically of burning him at the stake. He was uh, dug up, bones burned, ground up, and scattered in the nearby River Swift. They just couldn't attack him enough or hate him enough. Likewise, the enemies of Christ were never fully satisfied with what they did to Jesus. John chapter 3, verse 19 said, This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and the men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. Church, the world hates Jesus with an unquenchable hatred. This is why it drives me crazy when I hear someone go out there and say, you know, uh, you know Jesus just loves you the way you are and just wants you to come. No. You're an enemy of God. You're an enemy of God. The world hates Jesus with an unquenchable hatred, and it would love to have the opportunity to add to his sufferings. But as soon as Jesus ascended into heaven and wasn't on earth any longer, who would the world, the enemies of the cross, now attack? Yep, the church. The enemies of Christ began per persecuting the church. Why? Was it because they hated each of the individual believers? No, it was because the church now stood in the place of Christ. And since Christ was no longer here to hate, they hated those who stood in his place. And that is the gap that the Apostle Paul is filling. That's why he is stating, and in my flesh, I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church in filling up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. They can't go after him anymore. He's on the throne. But we stand in his stead. And so since they can't continue to keep attacking him, they'll attack him through us. What Paul is trying to say is he knew suffering was inevitable. And he was taking his turn to suffer not only for the body of believers at Colossae, but for the whole body of Christ. Even today, as we read Colossians, we can gain encouragement from this example of the Apostle Paul's suffering. And this is what happens when we are willing to take our turn and suffer for the Lord Jesus Christ. We fill up what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. Now I rejoice in the suffering for you, and I am filling up that which is lacking of the tribulations of Christ in the flesh of me for the body of him which is the church. Suffering for the cause of Christ. Think of it this way. I figure in this world, we're going to suffer for many different, various reasons. Might as well be for the right one. So our efforts aren't wasted, but for the glory of the king. Paul knew it and rejoiced. May we follow suit today and, and 
throughout, though there may be a, an incredible vast amount of difficulties and sufferings, let us rejoice for what is being accomplished through it. Church, we have, as we pray each Sunday, we have loved ones that are unsaved. And we pray. Church, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the prayers of those holding me up in prayer for my salvation. I'm pretty sure that each and every one of you here today wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for the prayers of the saints. But it's got to be works in the faith. We're going to have to go out and go get them. Amen. Someone once asked C.S. Lewis, why do the righteous suffer? Why not? He replied, they're the only ones who can take it. I don't know if you know this, but at the Nicene Council, an important church meeting in the fourth century, of the 318 delegates that were there, fewer than 12 had not lost an eye or a hand or did not limp on a leg that was lamed by torture for their Christian faith. Warren Wiersbe once wrote, on the wall in his bedroom, Charles Spurgeon had a plaque with Isaiah 48.10 on it. It read, I have chosen thee in the furnace of affliction. It is no mean thing to be chosen of God, he wrote. God's choice makes chosen men choice men. We are chosen not in the palace, but in the furnace. For in the furnace, beauty is marred, fashion is destroyed, strength is melted, glory is consumed. Yet here, eternal love reveals its secrets and declares its choice. If you don't have something you would die for, sacrifice for, give your all to, do you really have a life worth living? Glorious Heavenly Father. Lord, as I lift this message up to you and proclaim it to this congregation, I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would motivate us in your direction. Lord, it's a scary thought to think of going into this world to proclaim the gospel. But Lord, courage is not the absence of fear but it is the overcoming of fear to accomplish what is necessary. Lord, may you work in our hearts and our lives through this message. May we accomplish all that you have set out for us to do for your glory. And Lord, as, as, as difficult as it is to say, Lord, whatever it takes. Here we are. Use us, Lord whatever it takes, for your kingdom, for your glory. May you be glorified. May you be the reason we live, the reason we serve, our purpose in everything we do. I give you glory and praise today through this message and ask, Lord, that you will have an impact through the hearts and lives of each and every one that can hear this message today. For your glory, for your purpose. I pray this in Jesus' name.